Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Malt House Games Podcast. My name is Delton. I'll be your host this evening. And with me, as usual, is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. I'm right here. We are a podcast all about board games, tabletop games, role-playing games, dice games, things of that sort, and also, most of the time, some sort of beer. Whiskey for my horses, beer for my Delton. Delton has found there is chapstick residue on one of the glasses, therefore it is mine. Luckily for me, he did not discover there is chapstick on it until he put way more than half the beer inside of that glass. Therefore, I win. I should start doing that more often. I even evened it up. Nah. But yes, we are uh, a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> this is episode number 158. Of the Malthouse Games podcast. The beer today, I just set the can down like a dingus. Like a dingbat. The beer today is one of the two beers we are going to have on this episode. And it's one of the two beers that we brought back from our journey to Board Game Geek Con, or otherwise known as BGG Con in Dallas. We headed down south to the land of the con. Yes. But uh, this first beer is St. Arnold. Uh, the can claims it is Texas's oldest craft brewery. I need some stats on that. This is their original amber ale, and it says perfectly balanced. What is considered a craft brewery? 6.2% alcohol by volume. I think a craft brewery is any brewery that is not at the distribution scale of any of the mainstream AB InBev or what's the other one? I don't know. Coors. Coors, and yeah. There's, a, there's another, though, that I can't think of the name of, but uh, yes. I think a craft brewery is any brewery that doesn't have that big of a of a distribution as well as they can experiment with beers all the time. Cuz a place like a, uh, you know anybody under ABM Bev, they really don't experiment a lot. There's a few like Goose Island, they experiment more than some and there's some different companies like that, but for the most part the big names, you know the 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 Budweiser, Bud Light, Coors, Michelob, all that stuff just sticks to one thing and one thing only. Have you ever heard the history of Schlitz beer? You've told me sometime, but go ahead. So Schlitz beer, I believe it was up in Milwaukee. Please, internet, uh, correct me on that. But Schlitz beer was like America's beer. It was the standard beer. If you wanted a beer, you got a Schlitz. And I remember my uncle had a bar growing up, and he had some Schlitz beer signs too. Well, Schlitz, so it had the same recipe forever. Like forever and day. Because like, like Del was saying, whenever you get one of those basic beers, when you get like Coors, whenever you get like Bud, Wiser, whatever, it's going to taste like Coors. It's going to taste like Budweiser. There's not going to be any changes to the recipe. Unless you're Slitz Beer, they got a new CEO who was like, oh, we're going to change the recipe. Completely bankrupted, like the oldest, one of the oldest breweries in all of Milwaukee. Like they lost Great. everything. And so now Schlitz Beer doesn't exist whenever it was really like the backbone of the beer industry back in the day. That's crazy, and I could completely see it because the people – who drink those more basic beers tend to have one that they love and they don't stray from it. Yes. And so it makes sense. You've got something like a Coors and you don't want to stray from it. And if you ever stray from it and it's not another type of Coors, like Coors Banquet they have now, you know, that's a little bit of a twist on the recipe in a different can. But if you just changed Coors and still called it Coors, yeah, you would lose a lot of money. You mean you shouldn't switch Coors? Yes. So you're also saying that <laughs> Craft beers can become uh, staples, but staples can't become craft beers. Yes. That makes sense. That's in my opinion. I don't know what the official definition is in the world, but there we are. Prove us wrong, Internet. Well, this beer from St. Arnold's is a basic amber ale, classic amber ale, as it says on the can. You can see through it. It is a very pretty amber color. It holds it has a nice head retention when you first poured it. They've kind of uh, gone down now. But... Just the taste of it is a nice, crisp, solid amber ale. It's a little carbonated on the finish, but not bad. It's got a good mouthfeel to it. It's not too hoppy. It's not too sweet. It's very much a just like if I said, I want a good amber ale. This is a good amber ale. It's nothing phenomenal, but it's not one that's bad. It's a solid classic. It'll get you drunk. It'll get you drunk, exactly. So I know that we alluded to having gone to BGG Con this last weekend. We didn't allude to it. We straight up said it. <laughs> so I know that we have, might have mentioned, we might have given you a hint that we might have attended BGG wink, wink. Con. Wink wink, 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 wink. Nudge, nudge. Blink, blink, blink. Uh, but what else have we been up to, Delty Poo, aside from the con? 
We had Thanksgiving at my parents this weekend. We got to see the progress on my brother's house that he's building. Uh, we got to hang out with my mom and dad and my brother and sister-in-law and my niece and nephew and just hang out and chill with them and listen to my dad bitch and moan about everything. And uh, As he should. I feel like after the age of 70, you should just get a free pass and just bitch and moan about whatever you want to. I mean, I guess so. Uh, then we had a lot of des- desserts. My mom bought a bread machine um, from Zoji Rushi, which is a fantastic company that makes uh, rice cookers, bread machines, things like that. Uh, she ended up getting it at a discount at Kohl's and has started baking with it now. And she made hot rolls. And then she did uh, a pumpkin pie and cinnamon rolls and a spice cake and made way too many sweets. So we've been eating on all that. But it's really been Thanksgiving. What was the What was last week? So the weekend before that, Brian oh. came over for board game day. That's right. Because it was board game day with Brian, and then it was BGG, and then it was Thanksgiving. So it's been it's been wonky. It has been very wonky. So it's been a lot of fun, though, too. I feel like I've, I've basically worked two half weeks because we were gone for half the week last week for BGG and gone half the week this week for Thanksgiving, and I'm gone half the week next week for a conference. And, so, uh, and then the holidays start, so I don't feel like I'm going to be working a full week until probably next year. But can't complain. It's been a very busy couple of weeks, but incredibly enjoyable, too. It has been. It's been very enjoyable. A lot of that is because we got to spend so much time with friends. Oh, here's the door. It's straight ahead. It's it's a game. So if you are not familiar with BGG Con or Board Game Geek Con, nobody calls it that. They call it BGG Con or BGG. There are two BGG Cons in the year. There's BGG Spring, and then there is BGG Con, which is in the fall. Spring is about half the size as the fall with the same library and is just a lot more chill. It takes place at the DFW airport at the Hyatt Regency there. And then the fall convention takes place at the Hyatt Regency downtown that has the little sky tower thing uh, in Dallas. And it gives a perfect overview of the grassy knoll where Kennedy was assassinated. And if you're like us, this week we were there during the 60th anniversary since his passing. And we saw a lot of people almost get hit by cars <laughs> because they just, like, walked out in the middle of the street. I don't know. Tyler said they were looking for blood or trying to solve the, the mystery or trying to figure out if the FBI really did do it. But they're just, like, in the middle of the street looking at the grassy knoll. And it's, like, a three-lane little little street. And they almost got hit by cars multiple times. We got a great view of that, too. Was it in 63? It was in 63, yep. Yeah. Uh, why did I always think it was in, like, 68 or 69? I always think that... He was assassinated so late in the 60s. Yeah, because he was assassinated about five years before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Jeez. That's crazy. I didn't, I didn't realize for some reason I always forget it was 1963. And the fact that 60 years ago is crazy. Uh, but yeah, so uh, the hotel is, it's right there, just like a block or two. Um, from, depending on, I guess a block or two if you're walking to get to the location of the assassination of Kennedy, the grassy knoll, the building where Lee Harvey Oswald was. And funny enough, two years ago, I mean, it's not funny, but it's funny. Uh, we were, BGGCon was taking place the same weekend again as the anniversary of the assassination. And so QAnon was set up in our conference, as well as a police officer convention. So we had a really fun time trying to guess if they were, if attendees or folks we saw randomly in the hallways or in the elevator were QAnon, board game geek, or cops. And sometimes it was difficult to tell, and that's a little scary. Yeah, I know we mentioned this a couple years ago in our BGG episode, but uh, QAnon was waiting two years ago for JFK Jr. to come back from the dead and usher in a new millennia and take over as president. And so he was supposed to do that on the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assass- of his dad's assassination, Kennedy Sr., but that didn't happen. Not 50th. It would have been... 58th. Is it? 58th. I thought you yeah. said 50th. My Not bad. 58th. Sorry. Uh, so yeah, that didn't happen. Uh, but also, I think they gave up after two years because Q, there's not a QAnon in sight, at least not that I saw. No, <laughs> not a QAnon in sight. The way you said it, it was just funny to me. It was non-QAnon. There you go. Uh, but yeah, so that happens every time in the fall convention, around the fall convention time, though, getting to see people out there doing you know all kinds of different things around that site. But we have not been to BGG Spring. Hopefully... We're going to be going this spring, even though it is exactly one week after we return from our vacation to Hawaii. 
Hey, it's gonna be fun. So that's if we, <laughs> we want to go. It just we might be very exhausted, but we'll see. Um, but fall is our favorite convention that we go to. Absolutely, our favorite true convention because it is a convention with focus on gaming, playing games, playing more games, and playing. Guess what? More games. So what do we play this time, Delty Poo? We never play as much as I want to play, but that's because we have such a good time talking and chatting and spending time with friends that we don't ever get to see. The first night when we got there, we got to play KOTOR, which is an all-play game that I have and like. Uh, Me and Haley and Tyler played that, and then uh, Haley immediately tapped out (laughs) because it was already late. And I won. You did win. Uh, Me and Tyler played his two-player prototype. And then the next day, we did a game of Cubitos. We did a goofy game of Butts on Things, which is a hilarious game right game where it's just cards that have things on them, and those things have butts. And you have to abut the cards together on the table. And you're basically using the taco with a butt. And if it's on one end and you add a taco with a butt three cards away in one direction, then you get to take all the cards in between. Really simple and goofy and very fun. And you get to make a butt sandwich cookie, too. It's very fun, not because the game is like this masterfully designed game. It's because it's hilarious to have all these butt puns. And it's just fun and goofy and, you know, easy to sit down and play and have a laugh and then move on. You got hot dog buns, you got cactus buns, all sorts of butts. We picked it up for Lakin because she's the kind of kid who will absolutely love a game like that. By that we mean she's seven years old. She's seven years old. Uh, We also got to play test Tyler's 4X game that he put together. Uh, we got to then, uh, that's when, it was shortly after that, we met up with uh, Isaac and Ken, and we got to play Tyler's 23 Knives again, which we've talked about on the show several times. Yes, and we're so excited for 23 Knives. The Kickstarter for that should be launching in February or March. But it's In real- the spring. In the spring. There, there's no set time yet, but they're hoping for the spring. But it's really neat to have played it every year for the last four years and just see it grow and develop almost five years because the first time we played it was in spring of 2019 at the first cabin con yep or the first cabin con we went to that is and so it's almost been five years since we played it for the first time and it's amazing to not only see how it's grown and developed but it's also exciting to see tyler launch his new uh his new company proof rock studios exactly so go follow them on social media proof rock studios pru F-R-O-C-K Studios. Uh, Go find them, follow them, and keep an eye out for all information about 23 Knives. Uh, He's been working with his brother with illustrations. His brother's doing the art for it, and they're coming, uh, they have gotten quite a bit of the art done, and it looks very good, and we're excited to see the final product once they finish polishing the graphic design and the art and get everything put together. Uh, But we got to play it, had a really good time, uh, like Haley said, love seeing the changes every year, and it's definitely in the best place it's ever been. And I'm very excited to see it hopefully hit Kickstarter when they're wanting to in the spring. We also got to play another prototype called Winter Rabbit, which is from Absurdist Productions here in Oklahoma. Yes, they are the creators of Paleo Vet and Churrascaria, so you are probably familiar with them if you listen to our podcast. Yes, exactly. So it was Will and David. We got to sit down with them and Tyler and sit and play through Winter Rabbit and had a really good time with it. Uh, I really want to sit down again outside the convention space where I can focus a little more on the game. Uh, But I had a lot of fun and I like all the ideas that are represented, but I want to take the time to be able to look at the stories and the different little things that are happening and really focus in a quieter environment. But I think it's going to be a really cool game, so I'm excited to hopefully play that again sometime soon. Uh, Worst case scenario at TokenCon. And I want to see how it develops and gets closer to hopefully uh, whether I don't know if they're going to publish it the old way or kickstart it. Or I think they're going to kickstart it. Social, not social. What's it called? Crowdfunding. There we go. Uh, But very excited for that one because it was really neat. Yes, it really is. They are creating it in conjunction with uh, individuals from the Cherokee Nation. And so the game itself has a lot of Cherokee folklore and the cards and the text are in Cherokee as well. They have English and Cherokee, which is amazing. Yeah, it's really, really cool because it's, if you haven't ever seen one of the Native American languages here from the U.S. or the first people in Canada, I highly recommend looking it up, looking the written language up, because it's very different than English, as of course it would be. But it's a fascinating, they're fascinating languages to watch how they're written and the punctuation and pronunciations and 
really, really neat. And so seeing it on the cards and having all the stories tie into folklore within the Cherokee Nation, it's really, really cool. I'm excited to see uh, to see further progress on that and just, it, I don't know, it's really cool. I had fun with it. The next day, I, I guess we also, you went to sleep, but we played Tyler's Hidden Movement game. I went to sleep at like 1030 every night. Yeah. I, I couldn't hang, man. It, it was something about this year at Gen Con with Nick and Jennifer and then at BGG Con. Man, my brain just shut off at 1030 and I was out. I was tapped. Yeah, you really were. But we played his hidden, hidden movement prototype. Then the next day, uh, we got to play a prototype that we're really not allowed to talk about. I asked if we could talk about it openly. And the, he's, uh, the designer said he wasn't sure, but we could ask the publisher. And I said, it's not a big deal. I just wanted to check. So, uh, yeah, once there's more information, we will bring it up because it's going to be an instant buy, I think, for us here at the house. Uh, we got to play Handler. Handler their Carabic. It's Traders of the Caribbean. It's the original version of Port Royal, or sorry, Port Royal from Alexander Pfister. I picked it up at the bazaar. We got to play Villanimo which I keep misspelling, but Villanimo is a, I think it's a Bruno Cathala trick-taking game. It is. And you can pick it up right now on a Black Friday deal from 25th Century Games for $4. Shipping is 5 bucks For $9, it's still a good deal. A uh, really cool little game. I liked it a lot. It, I really liked it because I got a perfect score. You really did, you jerk. I had basically won by the third round. Um, we were playing against, what, there four of us, three of us? I, I can't remember how many more we were playing. But uh, basically, as long as I didn't come in last place at least once, I had the game. And so the very last round, the fifth round, Ken had come over and was hanging out with us. And so I just let him take over. And he kept up my perfect, my perfect score. So I got a perfect score in that game. Really proud of that. Won't let Delton live it down. Buy that game. It's fun. It was a good game. There are, they are doing a reprint. Somebody is doing a reprint this year. So this year or next year. So you'll be able to pick it up more, uh, more readily. We got to play a round or two of American Bookshop which is a trick-taking game from Taiki Shinzawa, who is the designer that I really like that designed Nine Lives and Ghost of Christmas, two trick-taking games from All Play. This is another one of his trick-taking games, but it has an interesting system where the cards have other symbols, and if the, well, you can play a card on your turn for to, into the trick, and if there's enough symbols represented of a certain type or something, you get to claim the trick, even though not, not everybody has played, and even if you didn't play the high card. So it's pretty interesting. I want to play a lot more of that. Uh, Ken is designing a game, uh, sort of massaging that system a little bit and doing something slightly different with it. So we played that several times as well. We got to play Gremlins Holiday Havoc that I bought at the, at the uh, virtual flea market. Very goofy slapping game. You flip a thing over, and if it, two colors match on the table, you slap them and you can take them. Very goofy. It's Gremlins. I like it. Uh, we played Tyler's Jellyfish game, which, again, we've played several times now, and every time we play it, it is changed and is developing and developing, and this is definitely the best it's felt yet. And it's another game. I'm excited to see it go further. We played Cat Tower, which is a simple stacking game where you fold a card and you stack it, and they're kitties, and that's the game. Got it for Haley because it's cats. I like cats. But Tyler likes cats, too. So Tyler and I both like cats. That's so we true. got it for both of us. I like cats, too. Yeah. But. I'm just not weird about it. Exactly. You're a cult of cats. And then our first play, I don't even have marked a winner. Why don't I have marked a winner? Oh, I do. It was just one of the other people I don't have in my phone. They're marked as anonymous. Oh. <laughs> just because I don't know them. Um, we got to play what is quite possibly my favorite game we played at the con which is Dodo's Riding Dinos. It's so ridiculous, and I love it. So Dodo's Riding Dinos, I don't even know who publishes this game. Let me look at the picture here. It'll tell me. Uh, it is from Draco Studios and Detestable Games. It's designed by Ruben Hernandez. It is... All the artwork are goofy-looking Dodo birds riding goofy-looking dinosaurs, and the game is Mario Kart, the board game. You have your little miniatures on the board on the racetrack, and the racetrack is just hexes. And if you move two spaces, you just move two spaces. And if you move two spaces and someone's in one, you skip over them, and that's moving one space. So you actually get to jump them as your one move. 
and you have a hand of cards. You pick a card you want to play. Everyone puts them face down, reveals them at the same time. You move, and then you do your special ability. And the special abilities are where the game really shines because then it becomes a dexterity game of flicking eggs, dropping meteors, limp-wristing banana throws, and underhand off-the-table feather tosses to try to damage your opponents, which means they discard their hand. Uh, all Moving Haley's amazing move where she threw the feather and whatever dinosaur she hit, she would move one space behind. She was in the middle of the pack. She threw the feather and she hit the last dinosaur on the board and got put in last place. And it was the funniest thing ever. Which is not the one I was aiming for. So you take a, a game that is very much back and forth, combine it with dexterity. I know I'm going to lose, but you know what? I had a grand old time. It's a very, 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 very fun, goofy Mario Kart-like time. Uh, yes, fantastic. We got to play Polterfoss, which I like a lot. It's a bluffing bidding kind of game where... Bluffing bidding, pressure luck. Yes, it's also known as Barrel Dice. I, we played this. David brought it to Cabin Con a few years back. And we played it there for the first time, and I really liked it. I've just never picked it up. But it's basically, you're a bartender, you roll some dice, and the dice have numbers. If they stand on end, that number's active. If they're laying down, you basically didn't hit with those dice. Or barrels, barrel dice. And you're going to have some barrels that stand up. You set them off the board. All the players, aside from the whoever's the bartender that turn, is going to play one or two cards from their hand, range zero through seven. And they're going to play as many as they want to receive in points, which is how much beer they want. Then the bartender has the choice. Do I keep rolling or do I stop here? If he keeps rolling, then uh, you basically just keep going until they either miss or until they decide to stop. If they stop, though, you're going to look at all the players' beer. And if the players want more beer than the bartender served, the bartender gets all of it. The player who wanted the most loses that amount, and the player who wanted the least gains the amount the player with the most lost. It's very interesting because you're not only bidding on how much the bartender is going to serve, but how much everybody else is wanting. And it's such an interesting like thought, uh, a field of thought for that game. And I really, really, really like it. And I played it again, and I really like it more. And it's just one that I need to pick up because I really enjoy it. We played Villanimo two more times. We played Little Tokyo which is the same kind of game as Animals on Animals. You take a wooden piece and you stack it. And you take some other wooden pieces and you stack those on other wooden pieces. And you try not to knock stuff down. But all the artwork is really cute. It is. And I loved it and I won it. We played Kites, which I think we talked about playing with Brian and Jessica, mm -hmm. where it's you're spinning plates, with, but the plates are sand timers. And it's we actually beat it, too, the first try. <laughs> it's my least favorite kind of game. I hate real-time games. But it's a good real-time game. Because it's even though it's stressful, it's not overly stressful, and it's cooperative, which is nice. I like the game a lot. Don't give me that look. We also played, which this is a brilliant game, CDSK. It's a trivia game, and trivia games, you either have one of two reactions just now. You had an, oh, I like trivia, or you had a, I don't like trivia games, which is, they're both appropriate. They are both valid. But CDSK is like the trivia game to end all trivia games for a party, I think, until you've been through all the cards. But what it is, is your space on the board is either going to be on a C, a D, an S, a K, or a challenge. On the C, D, S, and K, it's like, what was it? One of them was like media, uh, social media, not social media. One was media like books and movies, and one of them was knowledge of random stuff. And what happens is you pick up, uh, somebody picks up the card. I think it was the player in front of you or behind you, whichever. And they ask you, on a scale from 1 to 10, how well do you know the Office TV show? And you can tell them 1 through 10, whichever number. The 1 is the easiest question in the book. 10 is the hardest question. And the number, the, the, whichever number you pick, 1 or 4 or 6, if you get it correct, that's the amount of spaces you move on the board. So if you think you're really knowledgeable about something, you can go for 10, but they're hard. Like 10 are very difficult. Or if you're like me and Delton says, World War II, and I said, maybe I can do like 7 or 8. And Delton's like, no, do 10. No, do 10. And then I don't know 10. You knew everything but 10. And it was one of those where I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, when I read it, I was like, you're going to get this. You'll be fine. And then it was something that I have just never heard, which makes sense once we heard it. 
but it's really neat because it's a it's a trivia game where you pick how hard the trivia is and i love that like this the simple questions when i say that a one is the easiest question in the world it's like uh how well do you know the office on a scale of one to ten and you pick a one and the one is like the office is what kind of show and you're like oh it's a sitcom that it's that simple. So you be- all you have to do is know- all you have to do is know the show exists and you can get it right. No, I literally think the first question for the office one was the office takes place in what environment? A, an office. B, <laughs> a spaceship. C, a Taylor Swift concert. It's like that. Yeah, so it's a game where you get to pick if you're going to get the question right or not no matter what the topic is. It's it's really good for like it's a trivia game that I would happily own and pull out with a group of people. Then we played uh, Dinos riding, or Dodos Riding Dinos again, but this time it was with Justin and Anne-Marie from Fireside Games. And I still lost. And you still lost. It's okay. Justin won that one. I, I was doing really well for a minute. Uh, then we played Haley's favorite, Station Fall. Oh, God. It, so Station Fall is a game that's very popular right now. It was a Kickstarter game. It was not my kind of game. I'm so sorry, Tyler. It's a game where you're on a space station, and the space station is uh, basically going to blow up in so many turns or something. And you have to kind of escape. But it's kind of a it's a mixture between like a battle royale where everybody's everywhere and also Mr. Jack, in my opinion, because there's like 15 characters out on the map. You can control all 15 characters on your turn. You can pick who you want to move. You just have to influence them and move your token, and you can control them. Secretly, everybody at the table is actually one of those characters, which is where the Mr. Jack comes in. But it makes it really difficult when your character and your secondary option character that you could secretly, or I guess not secretly, that you could switch to in case that your first character dies or something, when they both get eaten on turn two of a 12-turn game, that was no fun for me. (laughs) Because then I'm just chaos the whole time. Um, the game's fine. It's cool in concept. And I think if I played it again now, I would get it better. And I would feel less I would feel less confused by everything. But the problem for me is that there's... It's very much a game that says, here's all these rules. Okay, go. And you don't have any direction aside from just going. So it's, re- it's really fine. Like I wasn't I wasn't a huge fan of it. I could see why people enjoy it. I had a couple issues that I immediately would change in the design, but that's just me. It's also hard because my second turn, I killed both of your characters accidentally. Yes, accidentally. I I didn't know they were Dalton's characters because that's the thing. It's like unless you reveal yourself or somebody accurately guesses, then that's the only way that they're going to know who you are. And so I'm literally it's round 2. And I'm like, I think I'm going to activate my character to do X, Y, and Z and kill two characters that I thought were completely random and not uh, connected to each other because they're in different parts of the entire board. And I killed both no, of them. they his. were together. Were they together? Yeah, because it was the exile and he was carrying the, the telepathic rat. Ah. And I, I was the telepathic rat and my target secondary was the exile. Oh, I did kill another character that, that round too, though. Yeah, you killed a lot. I killed a lot, but that was my MO. So, so Yeah. I'm sorry, Del. That was my bad. It's okay. It happens. Um, it wasn't my favorite, but also that was a very souring experience because I had, n- like, when I say I had no way to win the game, I had no way to win. Normally, even if your character dies, there are goals that need achieved that you can gain points for. Um, and you can gain those even with a dead character, so that's awesome. The problem is, both of my characters died. The one that was my, like, uh, secondary. Uh, Your secondary character is basically a target that you're either trying to kill or get to Earth. He died when he wanted to go to Earth. That's no points. Then my main character, which was the telepathic rat, the telepathic rat only wants to be in the same room as downed people like when the game ends. He's very complicated. So basically, there it was now impossible for me to get any points in the game. So it just ended very poorly and sadly for me. On round two. On round two, basically. And then I sat there for the rest of the two-hour game just going, ah. yeah, I had actually, sorry, I had negative one points. I had lost a point somehow. What was the score in that game? Negative one for me. You and Tyler had three. Justin had five. And Mark had seven. I don't understand. Mark won really well. Justin only had five. 
because his monkey, I moved into an escape pod and made it pick up the gun. And so the monkey was in the escape pod with a gun. And a briefcase. And a briefcase. And I left it. I was going to have the monkey blow up the escape pod with itself in it. And I didn't. And had I done that, he wouldn't have even got five points. He would have been probably lower than me. That's what you get for playing your own game in a board game. Well, I had no other choice there. Uh, then later that night, I played 23 Knives again with Tyler um, and his buddy Paul. We played a three-player game to kind of test it out. And then me, you, Tyler, played Wordsmith the next morning, which is a word game where you have to physically build the letters out of little pieces. Uh, it was very much brain fart for the entire first <laughs> round. I we made like one so word. Tired. This yeah. was the last day of the con. Sunday morning at like 9.30. We're all dead. We played that. And then the final game of the con, I've literally gone through every game, and some people have played so many more. Uh, the final game of the con was only one of what would have been three rounds of the Barracks Emperors, which is a fantastic trick-taking style GMT game that was not on my radar and is now immediately on my radar. And we played it with Tyler. He learned it. He taught us. We played one round before we had to get it back to the library. And it's basically a trick-taking game where there's a card in the middle that's an emperor. It's worth so many points. And you are going to play a card on your side of the board of that emperor. So if there's an emperor in the middle of the table and you're sitting on the south of the board, you play to the south side of the emperor. Haley's on the north side of the board. She plays to the north. Tyler's on the east. He plays to the east. I guess he was technically west there. But either way, you're going to only play in that position on the emperor. But wait, there's multiple emperors all only distanced by one spot. Which means whenever Haley plays on the north side of the emperor that I just played on, she is simultaneous. Oh my gosh, I can't speak. Simultaneously playing on the south side of another emperor, the east of another, and the west of another. Therefore, you're playing every card you play is influencing multiple things. So even if it may be winning one thing, you also might be winning it on another. But since it's winning on a different side than the side you're on, it's going to a different player. It's very interesting and really good. Yeah, so we played a lot of games. We enjoyed ourselves a lot. And I know that we're technically going to a board game convention. But there's a lot more to the board game convention that we go to the board game convention for than the board games themselves at the board game convention. That's true. And I say we have a drink of this beer before we talk about anything else because I'm thirsty. You're always thirsty. I am always thirsty. So this second beer is from Panther Island Brewing, which is in Fort Worth, Texas. This is their Cannonball and Ornery Wee Heavy. I always want to say Ornery when I read it. An Henri Wee Heavy. Uh, it says its tasting notes are rich, malty, and caramel. 8.2% alcohol by volume, 12 ounce can, uh, brewed in, yeah, Fort Worth, Texas. It is dark as night. It looks like chocolate milk. It looks like espresso. It looks more like espresso than chocolate milk, but it just looks like a dark beer. So, a Wee Heavy is a Scottish style beer. I've always been a, wee, a fan of Wee Heavies. I've been a wee fan of Wee Heavies. It smells so malty. And like, it even says on the can, it's rich, malty, and caramel. And that's legitimately just the smell of it. You can tell that there's not a lot of hops in a Wee Heavy. It's thick. It's got a nice, clean finish to it. Oh, it's like a toasted caramel. It lingers with that toastiness. It's really good. I Again, I like Wee Heavies, though. It is a pretty darn solid beer, and I hope so because mm. it's high alcohol content. It's not that high. What I say? 8.2. It's only 8.2. Only 8.2, my butt. But yes, that's a good wee heavy, a delicious wee heavy. Uh, I'm a big fan of wee heavies, so especially in the winter time. Which it is because it is really cold. But yes, so as Haley was alluding to earlier, or talking about, there are more reasons to go to BGG Con than just playing the games. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. Yeah, so a big draw to BGG Con is the huge game library. So what, there's like 4,000 games down there, they say? I want to say it's just over 5,000. So There are duplicates of some, and they also have a shelf that's all the new releases of the past year. Yep, so about 5,000 games is what you're looking at, but... 
for us, one of the big draws is playing the games that aren't in the library, and that's playing the prototypes that our friends, designers, acquaintances, any anything that we can kind of get wrapped into. I know we talked about playing quite a few of Tyler's designs. We're, again, really excited for 23 Knives to finally launch next year. We're really excited to see the development of some of the other games. But we got to play a few more prototypes as well, and I really like that because it's neat to see games go from prototype to launch. We've seen a couple of those. I know that you dealt, you played Wavelength before it came out, right? Yeah, I got to play Wavelength uh, not long before they had put it out. Um, I got to play it. It was before they had finished making the little dial system. They had like a mock-up dial system to kind of showcase what they were trying to do. And so I got to try that out at BGGCon. Yeah, and so it's really neat to see they go from prototype to final product, see what they have create it, what they've added to it, and kind of see like the bare bones of the game. But it's really awesome too to share in the joy and excitement of the designers because whenever a designer is prototyping their game, most of the time they're really excited to teach it. Oh, absolutely. The, they, they want you to play it, they want you to try it out, and they want you to uh, just experience the, what they're trying to make, which is always really cool. I think that playing prototypes is always fun. Uh, I do wish the unpub area was in a more open space. Then where I didn't even know it was it existed. Like I knew there was an area, had no clue where. And then when Tyler was setting up there and was like, "Oh, it's up on the second floor. There's a little hallway by the elevators." I'm like, "Oh, that's where I used to play pitch car, and it's in one of the rooms where we used to set up the pitch car tournament every year for BGG." And it was just I wish it was in a better space where there could be more foot traffic. But it was nice to see that there were six or seven, maybe eight different designers set up at tables with their stuff for people to come play. Absolutely. And something I think that BGGCon should do is in the in the big gaming hall, set aside a few tables that are reserved for those folks who are, you know, prototyping some games and allow them to have some players wanted signs up. Oh, absolutely. I think they would get much more traffic and it would feel a lot more included in the convention rather than being tucked away in the hallway with the like miniature painting events and things like that. Like you're not you're not published yet. You go over here. And that's not how it should be. <laughs> no, I don't think it necessarily feels quite that way, but I also agree though with what you're saying that it, it needs to be out or at least put it down by the exhibit aisles cuz they cut off the exhibit area and then just have those gaming tables even if they were just down there, not even in the main hall. Absolutely. And so with that, we also love to connect with the designers. I know that just about every year we see uh, see Isaac there, Isaac Vega. He's one of our, I would say, one of our good friends now. He's just the sweetest human being and so kind yes. and so fun. And every time we see him, he's just an absolute joy and delight to be around. Absolutely. Isaac is one of the sweetest people we know, definitely. And we always get to see him when we go. I'm grateful this year because we actually got to play quite a few games with him. He we did. He joined the con this year, and so, what, two or three of the days, we actually got to sit down and play some games. We played the trivia game with him. We played one of Tyler's prototypes with him, and he's just really fun to just hang out with. He's a cool dude. Oh, absolutely, because we uh, that's the thing about BGG Con is BGG Con is the convention that the designers and the social media, like, influencers and everything, it's the, it's the con that they go to to just play games. Yeah. Because there were multiple times where... Um, we, so we got to talk to like Matt Leacock was just playing games and we actually got to play a game with him too. We did. And next to him, Martin Wallace was there and he sat down with some folks to play Dune. And then Eric Lang was running around. We saw James Hudson from Druid City Games. He was there with Matt Paquette just playing games. We saw Drew and Cole Worley. Yeah. With Drew and Cole Worley, we actually stopped and had a good conversation with them too. That's the thing is like they're not just there playing games, they're there also connecting and having conversations with people. It's it's very much a social con and very much a play oriented con. That's what makes it so nice is you can walk up to the designer and just, you know, hey, how you doing? I like your games. Or you can just say, hey, what's your favorite game you played at this con so far? And you can do that with the designers, with all of the workers, with all of the attendees. It's a game, a convention where everyone wants to talk about games, play games, look at games, do stuff surrounding with games. And it's so nice because it just feels like a community. Like BGG Con, I think more than any other con, feels like everyone goes there and just wants to hang out and game. And we always run into people we know and we know people that work there with John and Laney. We got to say hi to, of course. 
and we got to say hi to all these different people and talk to people we haven't seen in several years and some we see every year. And and then you see Stephen Bonacore playing uh, War of the <laughs> Ring for eight hours straight. And then you see Stephen Bonacore playing War of the Ring, the card game, the next day. Yeah, so you, you just run into people constantly, and it's just really nice to go to a convention. Everyone's wanting to just play games and talk about games, and then that's what they do. There's Yes, there's an exhibit hall. It's only like four aisles, fairly small. A lot of indie stuff and local stuff and some trinkety things here and there. But even with the tiny exhibit hall, like it's fun to go through the exhibit hall and talk to people and look at some stuff. And it's a great con for just getting to play games and, and, and present it that way. So it was really neat to go through the exhibit hall, but it's small because people are there to play. So if you're ever interested, it's very much worth going. You just have to get down to DFW and the hotel. Uh, the hotel is you know, it's a hotel cost. I want to say with fees and all, it's between 140, 160 a night. And so if you're staying with friends, it makes it much easier. And then the passes are, I think, 150 a piece. But BGG Spring is a similar hotel cost, but the passes are like 90 a piece. So it's much cheaper. It's a little smaller and it's at the airport. So you don't even have to like get an, a lift anywhere. Yes, yeah, I think uh, Tyler said that BGG Spring is even more play forward. Yeah, because there's just there's less stuff going on. There's less events. And everyone that goes, it's just very like chill and laid back. But yeah, so I mean, that's why we go to BGG, right? We have beer. I mean, we got to see, or we should have mentioned this too. On the way down, we stopped in Denton with Jesse and Catherine to have dinner. You might which, remember Jesse as uh-huh. a uh, person we had on the episode last year, right? Last fall. Ep- episode 122. I saw it on my spreadsheet. Yeah, he was our guest episode 122. Yeah, so Jesse and Catherine live down in Denton, and we've talked about them before pulling off and trying to have dinner or meet up with them. We had dinner at Pepita's Vegan Taqueria, which is delicious. Again, Jesse very kindly bought our dinner that night, Uh, but we sat and visited. We were going to go in and have a dinner and visit for like an hour, and it was like three hours we just sat and chatted because we haven't seen them in forever. I know, since last BGG Con. And that's the thing with BGG Con is it's our con where we see our friends we only see once, maybe twice if we're lucky, times a year. So hanging out with them, getting to see Alan for the short time that we did, getting to hang out with Tyler the whole con. Like it was just a really good convention, seeing friends again. And we just highly recommend BGG Con to everybody. Yes, incredibly grateful to see everyone this year. Had a good con and we're ready, all ready for BGG Con 2024. And now, join us for a Malt House Games podcast special, by Size Question. So the question for today's episode is... Which one of the approximately 28 games that Delton brought home from BGG Con are you most excited to play? I don't think it was 28, but it might as well. Actually, so here's the thing. BGG always does a daily prize drawing for 20 people every day. And uh, Haley won last year and Tyler won the year before that. I won this year. (laughs) One of them. And each of us, I think the last day too. I think so, but I won three games and then a full set of four of the Series 5 art posters, which I'm very excited about. But here's the thing. Even if you did win three games and came home with 28, that still means you bought 25. That's true, but hey, I made $7 profit over the con selling and buying games. You did. So I could have came out with a lot of money, but instead I came back with a lot of games. <laughs> <laughs> so Delty, which one of those games is your favorite? Which one are you most looking forward to playing? I am most looking forward to finally getting to play 878 Vikings from Academy Games. I've wanted 878 Vikings for a long time. It's a Viking game placed in the year 878, where I believe you're invading England, if I'm correct. It's one of the many Viking invasions of England. But it was the base game. Uh, all the cards are sleeved. It has the like woodcut printed card holders from Academy Games. Has the building miniatures in shrink and the first the Viking Age expansion all in shrink. Everything wrapped up for seventy bucks. Which, if you know the game by itself, is generally like seventy bucks or eighty bucks retail. So I was very happy to get all of that together for a good price. And it's just I'm excited to play. What about you? Pass tally. Do I know what it's about? No. Is the box pretty? Yes. Did Delton say I'm going to like it? Yes. I showed you what it's like, kind of. Yeah, but I don't remember. But I think it's going to be fun. Whatever it is. It will be. I brought back some cool stuff, which that means we have more stuff to talk about on this podcast in future episodes, which means if you want to make sure that you're in the know on those podcast episodes, make sure to give us a follow, a like, a share, a subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, First off, I want to give, I say first off, this is the second thing. Next, I want to give a shout out to our amazing Patreon patrons 
who are Alan, Jennifer, and Cliff. Thank you so much for supporting us on Patreon in the level, at the level, in which you get shouted out at on Jesus Christ, the podcast. <laughs> Uh, there are many other levels you may go look at if you would like. There are other people that support us. Thank you all so much for helping us keep this thing afloat. If you have a game that you think we should talk about, or if you want to know what games I brought back, you can always send us an email, contact at malthousegames.com. You can also reach out on all social media at Malthouse Games. You can find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-Y-G-E-K, but I am more active on Instagram than Twitter nowadays. That is at Squirrely Geek. I think that that's everything. I feel like I'm missing something, but if I am, we'll figure it out. And if I'm not, we won't figure it out. <laughs> I think you say that every episode. I really do. I need to have like a little thing with me where I just go beep boop bop down the, the checklist and knock each thing off. But that's going to be everything for now. We're going to finish these beers we go hiking in the morning for my birthday and tomorrow evening we're gonna play some games with brian and jessica and have a good time having a small game night at their house or our house i don't remember which house uh but i think that that's our weekend plans and i think that's everything so until next time sit back relax grab a drink and play some games we'll see you folks later goodbye bye